All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pentagon Briefing Room. I'm Colonel Gary Keck, the Director of the Press Office, and it's my privilege t today to introduce you to our briefer, who is Colonel Paul Funk, Commander of the 1st Brigade, 1st Cavalry Division, the Iron Horse Brigade. He wanted to make sure that I pointed that out to you. Uh, Colonel Funk's brigade arrived in Iraq in November 2006 and operates in the, as part of Multinational Division Baghdad. He's coming to us today from Camp Chaji, which is northwest of Baghdad. And this is a first, uh, first time opportunity to brief the Pentagon Press Corps, so be kind. <coughs> He's going to give us an operational update, and then uh, I'm sure he'll take some questions. Paul, I want to thank you for taking time out with us today, and with that, I'd like to turn over to you for some opening comments. Uh, good morning. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about my unit and the area in which we operate. The 1st Iron Horse Co Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division, deployed from Fort Hood, Texas in November of last year. We are an enhanced brigade and our attachments include the 137 Field Artillery from the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Infantry Division. That brings the total number of troopers in the brigade to about 3,800. Our operational environment is in the northern portion of the Baghdad province. It consists of 900 square miles and is the largest brigade area in the multinational division Baghdad. It is roughly 15 times si the size of a brigade area inside the ba Baghdad security belt. This is a primarily a rural area with about six, 160 population centers and a total population nearing 2 million. Our operating environment runs from Tarmia in the north, which is 27 miles north of Sadr City, to Abu Ghraib in the south from Sabo Bor in the west to Husseinia in the east. In terms of ethnic composition, the majority of our operating environment is Sunni. The primary line of demarcation, demarcation is the Tigris River with the Sunnis in the west and the Shia in the east. Our brigade's mandate is to provide a safe, secure, and stable environment working in a professional manner together with the Iraqi security forces in the best interest of the Iraqi people. Using this as a backdrop, we have developed a campaign plan working along six lines of operation, security, transition, economics, essential services, communications, and governance. Each one of these is essential, and all are equally important to the success of our operation. However, it is my belief that our long-term success will be the direct result of our efforts along the security and governance lines of operation. Security in our operating environment is assessed as moderate and holding steady. The number of extrajudicial killings has the has de decreased since our arrival. Most extremist acts are conducted by a finite number of individuals and it is not prevalent throughout the population. We're having an increasing success with eliminating the number of IEDs along the roadways. However, the movement of insurgent personnel, weapons and equipment through our area continues to be an issue. To eliminate these threats, we are targeting critical leadership nodes and having success destroying the insurgent networks. Decisive to the security is our ability to maintain freedom of movement throughout our operating environment. This is accomplished by conducting near simultaneous operations across the area using ground and air pla based platforms designed to prevent enemy influence on our operations in support of Operation Farad al Qanun. I have three goals for the security in our operating environment. First, we want to disarm extremisms in whatever form it may present itself in our sector. Second, we want to maintain freedom of maneuver throughout our operating environment. Lastly, we want to marginalize the insurgents in order to drive a wedge between the insurgents and the population. This last effect will only be achieved by increasing the capacity of the local government in conjunction with the abilities of the Iraqi army and police to provide the appropriate levels of security to enable good governance, economic development, and essential services for the needs of the populace. The brigade's ability to transition the security mission to the Iraqi security forces increases daily as the Iraqi army and police strengthen their resolve to continue the fight to fight the terrorists and their affiliated groups. The challenges include leadership, training, equipment, accountability, and responsibility. Our transition efforts with the Iraqi army will be based in our ability to assess the capabilities of the ISF in these areas and build relationships with our Iraqi counterparts that allow us to ensure the capable leadership is present and enduring. The key to this counterpart relationship is our partnering of one U.S. company to each Iraqi Army battalion. Let me break that down for you in terms of force ratio. 
by highlighting the number of U.S. soldiers assigned in an advisory role to the Iraqi army. Prior to our arrival, just one U.S. soldier was assigned to the, an advisory role for every 70 Iraqi army soldiers. By partnering U.S. companies to Iraqi army battalions, we've achieved a force ratio of one U.S. soldier to every 14 Iraqi army soldiers. This is additionally significant because we have placed our best and brightest soldiers in these advisory roles, in large part because we believe that this is the best solution to develop lasting capabilities in terms of training, leadership, and accountability. We, in essence, are training the Iraqi army as we fight, ensuring that we develop leaders capable of training, equipping, and fighting their organizations. Currently, there remains a significant shortfall in the abilities of the Iraqi police forces in the areas of uh, leadership, personnel, training, and equipment in my area. Equipment shortages are not the main concern for the station, but rather a lack of proper accountability and responsibility. Systems for personnel, equipment, and accountability, as well as general station operations and maintenance are much greater issues. The entire Ministry of, of Interior, or MOI, system continues to struggle concerning logistics, resupply, and personnel administration outside the security districts. These struggles limit the ability of the Iraqi police to become a better and more competent uh, professional security force. The concept of the IP transition way ahead is to continue to focus the emphasis of police transition teams on critical locations and tactical focus areas within our area. In these critical locations, PTTs focus their efforts on community policing through dismounted patrols as well as embedding IPs in the surrounding community. We will continue to build joint security stations as a way ahead to allow IA, IP, and coalition forces to fuse operations and intelligence functions at the local level. The five JSSs in our area have been very successful and we continue to improve their functionality and capability. Economic development in our sector is experiencing challenges as Iraq rebuilds. The largest industry in our sector is agriculture and it makes up about 40 percent of the local economy with the remainder remainder of the economy consisting of uh, state-owned enterprise sector and small businesses made up predominantly of vendor stands at local markets and roadways. Our role in economic development is focused on influencing those sectors that are within the capabilities of my brigade to affect. These initiatives consist of programs such as the microfinance loans, micro grants, and the establishment of a vocational and technical education program. The predominant focus of my brigade, however, is on building local government capacity that will provide enduring capability of sustained economic growth and government stability. Projects to improve the distribution of essential services for the people are underway with a focus on transitioning the management of these essential services to the local government. The, the brigade is currently managing 86 reconstruction projects that cover all aspects of essential services to include sewer, water, electricity, trash, health, and education projects. These projects are small and meant to provide temporary relief as the government of Iraq grows its capacity to provide these services to its population. Our communications focus lies in two areas, keeping the soldiers and their families informed with the most current information concerning operations here and informing the local Iraqi po populace. To communicate the home front, we host monthly vi video teleconferences with families, produce monthly newsletters, and provide soldiers with access to email and phones. We are currently planning on providing live video coverage of the graduation ceremonies of the Fort Hood area schools so that soldiers can watch their sons and daughters graduate. We remain extremely proud of the determined and superb efforts of our family readiness, readiness groups and the rear detachments continue to provide. We are working to keep the local Iraqi populace informed through, the, through their local government. We are currently working with the local Qadas, Nahiyas, and councils to build the capacity to inform the local populace concerning issues that pertain to their area. Our goal is to have the minutes from the governmental meetings posted in the local newspaper and distributed at government facilities to ensure the populace is informed of what their local government is doing for them. Our government developed campaign plan is based on the building local government capacity within three branches that make up the Qatar governments. These branches of local government are the executive, consisting of the mayor, or the key maqam, the council consisting of elected representatives from the Qatas, and the technical branch, which is responsible for the provision of essential services to the local populace. Our government development efforts involve a, an aggressive campaign in partnership 
with USAID and the U.S. State Department that involves a series of governmental development conferences between the Qatar's and the province. USAID sponsored public administration training programs and the use of funds available to the brigade for reconstruction projects and programs. The government development conferences are an initiative that was started in partnership with the Baghdad PRT and are meant to uh, address the lack of coordination between the Qatar's and the provincial government. We have held two conferences to date and a third is scheduled to take place this month. This upcoming meeting will focus on the ministry support to the Qatar's and will involve the provincial governor as well as the Kiyim Makams and the Qatar technical br branch officials. Public, the public administration training portion of our campaign is meant to build the bureaucratic foundation of local government that is necessary for effective governments. This involves a partnership with USAID and the Iraqi government's training program. Finally, the brigade is focused on the use of reconstruction funds to both facilitate the reconstruction of physical infrastructure and build government capacity within the Qatar's. This is done by enforcing the bureaucratic process within the local governments of nominating, nominating designing, and approving reconstruction projects before the brigade commits reconstruction funds towards these projects. These government de development area efforts are challenging and complex and will require tenacity and patience as we move forward in rebuilding Iraq. I see a lot of promise in the future of Iraq. The issues here are difficult and challenging, but not impossible to overcome if the Iraqi people and their elected leaders work together. We are here to help them in this endeavor, whether it is security, transition, communications, economics, essential services, or governance. Together we can be successful. With that said, uh, I'd like to turn it back to you for questions. Okay, we appreciate that uh, thorough review of your operations and I would remind you that he cannot see you, so please identify who you are when you ask your question. Pam? <clears throat> Sir, this is Pam Hess with United Press International. How many police do you have? Um, how many have you added um, or have you seen added since you all arrived? And what's the relationship between your local population and the extremists? Do they passively tolerate them? Do they actively support them? Um, you said one of your goals is to drive a wedge there, and I'm wondering what your baseline is. Well, that's a great question, and I will tell you that the, the people of Iraq are tired of the extremists. They are ready to get on with it, uh, rebuilding Iraq, and we see that more and more every day. Uh, to the second part, uh, the Iraqi police, uh, we have uh, uh, roughly... Uh, in my area, I have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, oh, 14 stations. Each one has about 150, so uh, somewhere around uh, 1,000 policemen, a little bit more or less. Colonel, it's John Hendren at ABC News. Can you tell me if you've had any effect from the surge, first of all, whether there are any of those troops in your area, and second of all, whether there has been any, any spillover in terms of either increased or decreased violence in your area as a result of the increased troop presence in Baghdad? Uh, first of all, uh, none of those forces uh, from the surge are in my area, although some are soon to come. Uh, secondly, uh, we are seeing that the enemy, based on operations in the city, we're seeing the en enemy has to start moving around. And as they move around, we're being much more successful in uh, capturing or killing them. I will tell you that uh, a good news piece of that is uh, IEDs are down in my sector about 40 percent. And I believe that's a function of they don't, the, the enemy doesn't have time to do as thorough a reconnaissance as they used to and when they put them in. I could follow up on that. Can you just give us any numbers on those IED attacks, what they've gone to and from? Well, I've had, uh, in my area, I have found 330 uh, since I took, uh, took over the sector in the uh, early part of December. Uh, now, uh, those numbers are down 40%. I used to see somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 120 a month, and now I'm down uh, less than uh, 65 to 70. Mike? He's, 
He was still talking. Colonel, it's uh, Mike Mount with CNN. You, you said um, <coughs> since your arrival, the extrajudicial killings have uh, decreased. Can you quantify that a bit and also tell us what you've done um, in order to drop those numbers? Well, first of all, uh, I probably averaged, uh, when I, we first got here, as many as uh, eight uh, extrajudicial killings uh, a month. And now I'm down to one, uh, one or two a month, and that, I believe that's the, directly re, uh, related to getting out with the population, living with them, and uh, communicating with them every day. And that's from our joint security stations, uh, where we pro can project combat power in uh, just about any place. That allows us to uh, to really focus our efforts to getting to the local populace. Partners, I'm partnered with 10 brigades, uh, 10 battalions and three brigades, and they're doing the same thing. Andrew. Uh, Colonel, it's Andrew Gray with Reuters. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the struggle that the police service continues to face uh, in Iraq and in your sector. Um, can you tell us a bit more about those problems? You mentioned in particular accountability, uh, leadership, I think, as well. On a day-to-day -day basis, what does that mean? Are the police uh, cooperating with you? Are they pursuing a sectarian agenda? What are the problems you face? Well, really, the, the biggest problem is getting them uh, to, come, to come back to work. And that's basically because of the, uh, the, the logistics functions. We've got to make sure that they get paid on time. They get the uh, proper equipment and training that they need. Uh, so it's more of a, a logistics func function of how we're, how we're getting those guys to come back. So the accountability piece is literally being, <laughs> being present for work. You have a, a continue to see uh, improvement in that area, however. I mean, of what, of what sort of level of manning are police units at in your area? Of those who should be turning up for work, how many are actually present? I would roughly say 75% show up when they're supposed to. Uh, manning levels, uh, as I, I think I stated a little earlier, are from about 100, 150 per station. That's running three shifts. So uh, that's about 75% of that. Colonel, this is Ann Flaherty. I was hoping, with Associated Press, I was hoping to follow up on um, an earlier question about uh, the decrease in attacks. You said that one of the things that you were doing, that you attributed that, uh, was getting out and living with the Iraqis and reaching out to the Iraqi population. It was my understanding that the Army has been doing that all along. Um, so, so why was the, your predecessor in your area not doing that previously, or were there additional troops added into your area? Can you give us more specifics on why you think the attacks decreased? Uh, mostly it's because we're building capacity in the Iraqi army. I, as I said, uh, now we have the ability to project 10, 10 battalions worth of combat power out in my area. I also do have an additional battalion that my predecessor didn't have, uh, and that was, uh, but not based on the surge, that was based on uh, uh, positioning of uh, the striker element beforehand. A and I have their field artillery battalion, the 137. Uh, so by, as we build capacity in the Iraqi army and the police, it allows us the ability to get out more into the communities where we can, in fact, uh, talk to the people. Uh, Colonel, this is Lisa Burgess with Stars and Stripes. Are your police primarily Sunni? And when you talk about the logistics problem and the difficulties with pay, when I was there back in February, there were some issues with the government, which is primarily Shiite, being a little reluctant to flow money to the Sunni areas that you control. Are you seeing some of those same issues in general with your, is that an issue in go, with governance in general, and is that hampering your operations? Well, well, actually, no, because uh, 
my area consists of both Sunni and Shia on either side of the, of the river, and both are having the pay problems. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't make that a uh, whether I wouldn't make that a sectarian if, issue. More what I, I would say is it it is a continuing struggle uh, as we try to build lo logistics capacity and functionality. So th that's what I would say. I don't I don't see that as a uh, sectarian issue. <clears throat> it's Pam Hess again. Um, you say you have about a thousand police in your sector for a population of two million. Is is that enough? How many more do you need, and what kind of cooperation are you getting from? Um, I, I suppose there's tribes out there at being rural um, from them and in, in contributing more people. Actually, that that is correct, and uh, we see more and more people want to come to the Iraqi uh, police and uh, participate in ridding Iraq of the terrorists. And so, as a matter of fact, we'll have recruiting drives uh, fairly soon all throughout our sector. Sunni, Shia, won't matter. It's Iraq Iraqis uh, want to, uh, want, want, wanting one Iraq, and they are uh, ready to stand up and take part in that security. For the number of police that you want to get for your sector. Well, I, I will tell you, I, w I could always use more police. Uh, uh, like I said uh, in the opening statement, I have 160 population centers. In my opinion, we should have police in all of them. Now, could that be something like the county sheriffs we have back in the states? Perhaps, um, which would allow you to cover a bigger area. But uh, I'm not sure we're to that level of sophistication yet. But uh, yes, I would like to have more police and uh, we are working, ma taking the necessary steps to make that happen. Can you just be specific on how many more police you want and perhaps how many of those 160 population centers don't have sufficient police? Well, I, I can't really put a number on it. Uh, I'd like to be able to, uh, but as the 160 population centers, some are as small as 100 people, others uh, a thousand. So it really there's probably a ratio and, I, and I'll have to let the, prof the police professionals answer the question of how many more I, I need, but I would certainly like to have some more and as I said we will continue to work towards that. Um, so that's, that's about as specific as I can be on the police issue right now. Uh, Colonel John Hendren again. Can you um Tell us a little about how far your province is from being turned over to the Iraqis. In other words, it sounds like with those police concerns, um, that's one of the prime drivers of that decision. Um, how far away do you see this province from being independent? Well, sir, I'm actually part of the Baghdad province. So it's how far Baghdad is. Uh, you know, as we build functional physical infrastructure, build functional political infrastructure, build uh, effectiveness and create a fair and open environment, uh, when Baghdad's ready, we'll be ready. Well, that question then, how about just your area? In other words, uh, is it, do you foresee in the future being able to redeploy troops from that area to somewhere else? I actually, uh, I'm not sure because uh, I, I believe with uh, the number of forces that we have in Taji now, this may be one of the uh, places that will have forces. You also on the, I don't know if you know anything about Taji itself, but that's also where the Iraqi training compound is. So all the Iraqi schools, uh, engineering school, the armor school, those types of military schools are on this compound as well. So I think as long as we're helping the, uh, Iraqi army build capacity, uh, we'll have U.S. forces here. Ground combat forces, uh, I don't know the answer to that. <coughs> Colonel Funk, I'm Jerry Gilmore with American Forces Press Service. You indicated that um, th there's progress being made in uh, tamping down the violence in your area of operations. How much have the Iraqi troops helped with uh, your troops as partners? You said that uh, the enemy doesn't have uh, as much time as before to place IEDs, perhaps. How are the Iraqis helping in this regard? 
Well, I'll tell you, they're doing a fantastic job in my area. The two, uh, two of the brigades uh, are absolutely outstanding. And uh, I, I will tell you that we partner almost every mission almost every day. And that's where the improvements lie, and that's where uh, the capacity is built to really become more effective, a uh, more effective force. By doing it day in and day out together, that's how I see uh, the, uh, the Iraqi security forces improving. And they are a huge part of my fight up here. In a wedge between the insurgents and the population, how are the Iraqi security forces helping you gather more intel to uh, thwart some of these attacks? Are they doing that? Population getting tipped. Absolutely, they are. They're absolutely doing that. You know, it's their country. They 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 recognize people that, uh, and in many cases, it's uh, their neighborhoods, and they recognize foreigners, and they understand uh, different dialects of of uh, Arabic. So they are they are a tremendous uh, resource in terms of intelligence and reconnaissance. One more. This is Lisa Burgess again with Stars and Stripes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about some of the issues related to the Sunni insurgent rat lines that you have up there and some of the operations that your, uh, your soldiers are doing to try and quell that? Well, first of all, I think they're absolutely, uh, that's the absolute right name for them, rat lines. Secondly, um, we are working, as, as I build capacity in the Iraqi army, and as we continue to uh, understand our environment and our sector better, we're cutting those off. By changing the number of advisors, uh, you know, uh, or partnering with the Iraqi army units, we're really increasing the eyes, you know, in a ratio from, which was one to 70, is now one to 14. So uh, it is really, uh, it's really something to see. I'm very proud of uh, how well my, both my unit and both the, uh, and all the Iraqi Army units are doing in my zone uh, to stamp out the insurgents and to cut down things like the rat lines. Perhaps one of the more recent operations that you did, maybe in the last week or so, just a little something. Talk proud about your troops. Yeah, I would love to, uh, and and it happened to well, it, is, it happens to be that it's a partnered operation. We conducted a, uh, an Iraqi-led uh, brigade operation on both sides of the Tigris River in two of the most uh, um, difficult areas in my sector, commanded and controlled by the Iraqis, where my the partner unit with them, uh, one seven cavalry provided a QRF access to the uh, aviation. They actually uh, detained uh, over 18 insurgents, found uh, three or four caches, and it was a tremendously well-executed brigade-level operation done by the Iraqis with the assistance of uh, my, my great troopers. frame of that operation. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, Paul can. I, I have to get your name. I cannot remember right off the top of my head what the name of that operation was. Last week. Just looking for the time frame. Time frame. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Looking for the time frame of that operation, was that very recently, within the last month? It, it was actually in the, uh, within the last two weeks. All right, appreciate it. Well, thank you much, uh, Colonel Funk, for being with us today. Based on what we're, what's going on in your sector, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? I do. I, first of all, I'd, I'd like, to, uh, like to take the opportunity to again thank our family readiness groups and the rear detachment commands for their enduring support. They are the substance behind our success. Also, I want to say how, how proud I am to be able to tell the story of the Iron Horse Brigade Combat Team and our fabulous troopers. They astound me every day with their agility, lethality, 
and compassion. And we will continue to work to drive a wedge between the insurgents and the population in partnership with the Iraqi army and police. And, at, and as that wedge drives deeper, and as the capacity of the local government grows, we in the Iron Horse Brigade believe that the populace will realize that a successful future is on the horizon for the people of Iraq. Thank you for your questions and for your uh, time. First team in Iron Horse, and uh, a little caveat, uh, that operation that I named was called Decapitated Serpent. Okay, Colonel Funk, we appreciate it. And we hope to hear from you again real soon. Thank you. You bet. Have a great day. Iron Horse. Okay, we're going to stay on the line for a sec. I'm still here. <laughs> 